Okay, now we are recording, so let's uh, please have uh, Tom Bachman um, here that's going to talk about, what was the title again? Um, about uh, uh, pullbacks for the Rost Schmidt complex. So I'm going to mute everyone and then uh, unmute Tom. Yeah, okay. Okay, so now hopefully you can see my presentation. Yes, so unfortunately I am not entirely up to speed yet and I don't have one of the fancy electronic writing devices or at least not one which works reasonably well. So for this talk it will be slides only. Very strange experience, but okay. So let's see, so what I, what I wanna do is I want to talk about um, an actually fairly concrete statement or almost elementary statement about uh, sheaf cohomology, which is maybe quite uncommon for the field which I work in, which is motivic commutable theory, which tends to be perhaps technically challenging and uh, esoteric or some other unkind words which people might use and uh, they might not always be totally wrong about that. But so this is very concrete. On the other hand, uh, if I just show you the statement which I want to talk about, then you're going to say probably, well, who cares? And I, I think that would be a natural reaction. So that's why I'm, I'm saving the statement for the middle of my talk because I want to not scare everyone away or send them to sleep. So what I want to do first is I want to show you some sort of a teaser trailer type, uh, a couple of slides and uh, to, to get to some result, which hopefully you will agree if one could prove that would be good. And uh, well, the point is that in order to prove that you need this technical thing, which I want to talk about. And uh, yeah, okay, so that's what it is. So let me, let me be begin with this sort of preview or motivation type section. So as is very common in my work, uh, not sure what it says about me, is that uh, I want to talk about an analog of, of a very well known result in, uh, in classical topology. So let me suppose then that we know what the space is and suppose I have one of those, I call it X and I, I've chosen a base point for that space. Uh, no problems so far. And then associated with that, we have certain invariants, right? Which are maybe groups. So they're rather algebraic, which is why the subject is called algebraic topology, I suppose, or maybe that's one of the reasons. So for example, we have the homotopy groups denoted by pi star X, and we have the homology groups, H star X, and uh, if you weren't completely asleep in your first course in algebraic topology, then you know that usually the homology is sort of computable and uh, the homotopy is pretty impossible. That's, that's what often happens, of course. Uh, there can be exceptions. Um, but uh, the homotopy groups are very good, right? Because uh, basically almost by definition, if you have a map which induces an isomorphism on all the homotopy groups, um, then it's gonna be an equivalence, a homotopy equivalence or something like that of spaces. So that's, that's the best kind of map. Um, but with homology groups, who knows? So you have these easy things, which are the homology groups, which can do something. You have the hard things, which are the homotopy groups, which can do everything. And then the obvious question, of course, is how much information do you lose when you, when you pass the homology? And uh, well, as a first starting point there, there's this observation that these two invariants are not unrelated. Um, in fact, they're, they're connected by a, by a canonical uh, morphism called the Hurevich map. And uh, well, it's not always an isomorphism. That's, that's just what life is but sometimes it is. So there's this uh, so-called Hurevich theorem, which basically says that the, uh, the, the, the lowest possible homotopy groups, I mean, the no lowest non-zero homotopy group is the same thing as the lowest non-zero homology groups, uh, homology group, at least when that makes sense, right? So when uh, pi zero is not a group at all, it's just a set and pi one is a group, but it's not a billion, but at pi two and pi three and so on, there are billion groups. And the homology groups, they're all abelian groups. So, I mean, surely you can only hope for this to be true starting from sort of pi two. And that's the, the, the form of the Hurevich theorem that, I, that I'm quoting here, right? So if you take a simply connected space and uh, then its lowest homotopy group is the same thing as the lowest homology group. 
Um, okay, so that tells you that somehow the lowest information you can get from homology, but the higher information you, you cannot. I mean, they're just different. But so sometimes sort of this lowest information is good enough, right? And so it turns out that you can soup up this Uravich theorem into something which I hope is called the um, homology Whitehead theorem, which, uh, well, it says what I write here, uh, but what it says is you take two simply connected spaces and you have a map between them and you want to know when is that an equivalence or a uh, homotopy equivalence. Well, you know this is always true if it induces an isomorphism on the homotopy groups, but it turns out that because your spaces are simply connected, if it induces an isomorphism on homology group, then it's also an equivalence. So that's very good, right? So it tells you that if you want to know if some map is an equivalence and you're working with simply connected spaces only, then you can check it on this easier invariant, which is called homology. Um, so, I mean, I'm not saying at all that this is the most optimal possible result, right? I suppose you can replace simply connected by um, connected and nilpotent or something like that, but uh, let's not get hung up on that kind of technicality. My point is that this is sort of a basic result from algebraic topology, which you likely use all the time, likely even without thinking much about it. And um, well, that's great. That, that, that's, that's a good tool. But then we do this um, motivic sort of algebraic topology or motivic homotopy theory. And then the problem which arises is that you have some sort of problem in motivic homotopy theory which you want to deal with. And then you're saying like, oh, of course, I, I was not asleep in the algebraic topology course. I know how to check things, uh, check it on homology or whatever. But so the difficulty with the motivic homotopy theory is that a lot of things are set up to look like classical topology, but it's not at all clear that they behave in this way. So it's not at all clear, for example, they can check things on homology. So let me give you a, a very rapid reminder of what motivic homotopy theory means. So what we do is we, we, we fix some base field K, which will be perfect for my purposes. So for example, you can take an algebraically closed field, can take the complex numbers if that's, if that's your jazz. And uh, so then what basically what we want to study is we want to study smooth varieties over this field. So for example, if you took the complex numbers, then what we're trying to study is somehow complex manifolds, which are defined by polynomial equations and such that the maps between them also come from polynomials. So this is some very, very rigid category, which one tries to understand. And it's supposed to be analogous to somehow the category of smooth manifolds, maybe in the usual sense. And then what we want to do is, or what we can do is we, we build a, somehow a more flexible category. It's the so-called category of motivic spaces. Right, so every smooth variety is going to define a motivic space, but there are, of course, many more motivic spaces than there are varieties. And uh, so there are also more maps. So just like in topology, you have maybe the smooth maps between manifolds. That's the things which you start with, but you can also just view them as topological spaces. And then there are continuous maps between them and it's more maps, more spaces. It's, it's just how life goes. That's not super relevant what the motivic space really means if you believe that there's some kind of category or infinity category or whatever your mode of thinking is, which, which does these things. But uh, just, just to put you at ease, I've written a definition there. Uh, I think, right, so here's the definition. You just start with pre-sheaves of spaces and then you perform Bauss field localization, and just build some universal category which does what you want it to do. And the main thing which we do is we, we make the affine line behave like a contractible space. And also we do something uh, is we enforce this Navage descent and it, it's, it's not that relevant. It just means that you can glue together um, your spaces in a way, similar way in which you can glue together manifolds or varieties. And then, okay, so let's suppose I have one of these motivic spaces and I even give myself a base point, then there should be some sort of invariance which are similar to the um, invariants of the classical spaces, right? So we had the homotopy groups, and it turns out that you can define something similar, and uh, they're the so-called homotopy sheaves. So we put a little underline under it to remind ourselves that this is not, not just a group, it's in fact a sheaf. It's a sheaf on the side of smooth K varieties. And um, there's also some sort of analog of the homology groups, and in this case, I want to think of the motive of X. So there's this category dm of k comma z, 
which uh, I guess Wolvatsky constructed, so it's the so-called derived category of motives. Um, you should think of this as similar to somehow the category of chain complexes. And um, so there is a motive associated with every motivic space, and it's one of these, uh, it's in this, in this category. And somehow this, this should be some sort of replacement of the singular homology groups of a topological space. I mean, there are other possible replacements and you can ask questions about them, it's, uh, that's fair, but uh, I will run with this one for the, for the motivation section. And then what we want, of course, is we want, well, of course, but I, I would like some analog of this homology whitehead theorem. And this is the thing which I proved together with um, Maria. So um, first of all, I will assume that the characteristic is zero. Um, things can be said in positive characteristic, but let's just uh, state the easiest possible case. And I will also assume that the so-called cohomological two-dimension is uh, finite. So for example, you could take an algebraically closed field like C, or you can take um, the Gaussian numbers QI, but you cannot take Q, for example. Again, things can be said about this, but let's, let's concentrate on the simplest case. And the, the sort of statement which we want is that um, if you have some map between spaces, which induces an isomorphism on the motives or equivalence on the motives, then it was an equivalence of motivic spaces, right? And the, the, the challenge is to put some conditions on our spaces to make this true. And uh, so if you look at the classical result, then one might guess that it's a good idea to assume that it's uh, simply connected. So we assume that the pi zero sheaf is uh, the terminal sheaf and that the pi one sheaf is the terminal sheaf. So certainly you, you likely want to put this or maybe you want to replace simply connected by, no, by, by nil potent or something like that, but who cares? So I do that, but then it turns out that um, this is somehow not enough. But it does turn out that there's an extra condition which you can put on it, which is uh, this one here is so-called the S1 stable zero slice vanishes, or so-called some sort of one effectivity. And uh, morally what's going on here is that in the motivic world, we have two spheres somehow, we have GM and we have S1, and uh, the connectivity condition in terms of the homotopy sheaves somehow says it's connected in this S1 direction. And this condition here with the zero slice somehow says that it's connected in the GM direction. Um, well, I haven't defined what any of these things mean, so it's not clear how easy that is to achieve, but I would like to claim that it's quite quite often the case that this zero slice vanishes. For example, if you take rational varieties and look at their associate motivic spaces, then they will have this property that the zero slice vanishes. So like a Grassmannian, for example, is, is one of the loud ones. Okay, so this is, this is somehow the motivic homology Whitehead theorem. And I would uh, like to claim that this is a, it's a very useful result. But, uh, right, so then one has to prove it. And it turns out that the proof somehow consists in two steps. One is this uh, concrete thing about chief cohomology, which I want to talk about, which is, I mean, I would be very surprised if <laughs> you can relate the things which I will tell you about chief cohomology to this theorem. But it turns out that there's somehow some technical step and then you need uh, you need many more things. You need to study somehow the uh, homotopy co-niveau tower of, right? You need to use many words and you write a long paper with Maria, but uh, and you still need this technical result. And so I want to talk about this concrete thing. So if you thought that this, uh, everything I said so far, it was too abstract and it was too vague, then uh, never fear because now we basically start again and we do something um, completely different, but hopefully related. Okay, so what I need to do is, um, in order to prove this theorem, is we need to study so-called strictly homotopy invariant sheaves. So let me, let me give you some definitions right off the bat. So whenever I say pre-sheaf, or maybe, yeah, whenever I say pre-sheaf, what I mean is an, it's a pre-sheaf of abelian groups on the side of smooth K varieties. So there's no infinity, no spaces, no nothing, just, just the usual thing. And by a sheaf, I mean a sheaf in the Nisnevich topology. So there is this so-called Nisnevich topology. Um, so it's, it's not, ex not particularly relevant for this talk what it is. It's, it's finer than the Zariski topology. It's uh, coarser than the Etal topology. It has lots of useful properties, but it's, it's not really going to matter. And whenever I say cohomology, I always mean cohomology with respect to this topology. And now 
here's sort of the main definition is this is so-called strictly uh, homotopy invariant sheaf because it's a bit long sometimes it's called a strictly a1 invariant sheaf or just a strictly invariant sheaf and what it is well it's it's just some pre-sheaf or it's, it's some sheaf on this uh, well it's a sheaf in the sense of <laughs> the definition above which has the property that um, the cohomology is a homotopy invariant right so if you if you take any smooth variety then there's this projection map from x times a1 to x and so you can pull back in cohomology and what i want is that the sort of the sheaf itself is homotopy invariant and the first cohomology and the second and so on and so forth. And they're all homotopy invariant. So basically these are, these are the basic objects of study for the rest of the talk. And um, so maybe as an aside, how is this related to the motivic spaces story? And uh, so the point is that if you have any sheaf on the Nisnevich site, then you can look at the sort of Nisnevich infinity topos and um, so this, this sheaves of spaces, and there's an associated eilberg maclean um, sheaf, KNF. And what's going to happen, or what, what does happen, is that the category of motivic spaces embeds into the uh, infinity topos of Nisnevich sheaves. And if you take a general uh, sort of sheaf of abelian groups and then look at this KNF thing, it may or may not be the case that it lives in motivic spaces. And in, in fact, it, it will be, it will live in motivic spaces uh, for all and if and only if this is one of these strictly homotopy invariant sheaves. So that's somehow why, why they're relevant. They're sort of the einberg maclean objects in the motivic homotopy world. I'm sorry, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, so when you mentioned rational varieties, you mean that any two rational varieties will satisfy all the condition you asked? No, no, only the last one, sorry. So they will satisfy ah, okay. the zero slice vanishing. No, you still have to make it ah, okay. connected. That's a yeah. completely different problem. Okay, sorry, thank you. Sure. Someone has another question, I think? Yeah. Nothing. Okay. Um, uh, uh, so so uh, do you, uh, when you mean motivic spaces, uh, do you mean uh, it is... Uh, uh, A1 local, something like? E yes, that's what it means. So A1 local for, for a sheaf means this homotopy invariance of cohomology. It means motivic. Okay, so, uh, so, so you, your motivic spaces are all A1 local, I assume? Yes, so that's uh, uh, okay. it's not that relevant, but here the definition means that it's A1 local and Nisnevich local. Oh, okay, 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 thanks. Okay, right. So now what, what, what do we want to do? Well, the most obvious thing to do uh, with the sheaf is you want to compute its cohomology. Um, I mean, that's, that's some abstractly defined thing in terms of injective resolutions or what, what do I know? And it's, it's a bit unwieldy, but it turns out that there's somehow for these strictly homotopy invariant sheaves, there's a, there's a very good way of computing cohomology using um, what's called the Gersten complex. And um, the, the Gersten complex is, well, it's, as the name suggests, it's some special complex which you can use to uh, compute the cohomology, so some sort of resolution. And it's built, um, obviously, out of your sheaf F, and it's going to use the fact that it's strictly homotopy invariant. So it's going to be, be built using uh, certain special operations which you can do on strictly homotopy invariant sheaves. So they are called uh, contraction, twisting, transfer, and boundary. And um, so what I'm going to do in the next couple of slides is I'm going to tell you what these operations are then so that I will be able to write down the Gersten or Ross Schmidt complex, which can be used to compute this cohomology. Um, in principle, this is not uh, totally necessary to understand the main theorem once I get there, but I feel like I should uh, give you a flavor of uh, what this complex looks like. And so I should also give you some idea of what these operations are. So let me start um, with the contraction. So this, this works as follows. Suppose you have some smooth variety X, right? Then I can consider the product of X with the uh, affine line with the origin removed. And there's always the projection map P from X times A1 minus zero down to X. But there's also a map going the other way around, right? I can just ex include X at the rational point called one. And um, then I can do uh, the pullback in my sheaf. And what I get is, well, there's this pullback map from f of x to f of x times a1 minus 0. And then there's the pullback map from f of this one, f of x times a1 minus 0 back to f of x. 
And because, well, if I include that one and then I project down again, I get the identity, it follows that this composite here is the identity. But, uh, well, this, is, this sort of diagram is called a retraction. And whenever you have a retraction of a billion groups, what will happen is that the guy in the middle is in a canonical way, the sum of the guy on the left, which is of course also the same with the guy on the right, and some extra term, right? So I can do that, I can always do this. I can write f of x times a1 minus zero as the sum in a canonical way of f of x and some extra term, which I choose to call f minus one of x. And as the notation suggests, this f minus one of x actually, it depends sort of functorial, I mean, yeah, it's, it's functorial in x. So it actually defines a pre-sheaf. And so this pre-sheaf is called the first contraction of f and it assigns to x this, well, f minus one of x, which, which arises in exactly the way which I wrote there. And uh, there are also higher contractions where you just, well, you do this thing several times, the notation is very suggestive. Um, so it turns out that this operation is, uh, is very important. And uh, well, it's maybe not that surprising if you look at this um, aside down here, which is that um, this contraction is just somehow the GM loop space or a sheaf of F. Now, I don't I do want to make this precise. Okay, there's a, there's a question, I think. Question. Yeah. Oh, okay. sorry, I was gonna wait for you to finish your sentence. Um, ah, <laughs> but that's, that's all right. So this, uh, is this sort of similar to uh, when we try to do the fundamental theorem of K theory, I guess, and you're comparing like the K theory of a ring R to R with the TT inverse? Absolutely, yes. Great. So you learned that for K theory, the contraction is not that interesting. Well, you, you know something, but yeah. So it's, it's related to the fact that somehow we want, we have these two spheres and then loop spaces always with respect to spheres are somehow interesting in topology. So that's, that's the first operation. Then the next operation which we need is the so-called twisting. This is uh, well, a pervasive thing which occurs all the time for obvious reasons, but the, it's also really annoying, but okay, so let me, <laughs> let me try and uh, tell you about it. So what, how does this work? Well, the thing is that this time, we, again, we start with a smooth variety and we also start with a, with a unit on it. So with an invertible function, let me call it U. So all right, so it's just a map from X to A1 minus zero. And then what I can do is I can use this to um, write down an automorphism of X times A1 minus zero, right? I just, um, well, I do what I wrote here in the formula. I just multiply in the sort of T coordinate corresponding to A1 by this unit. And because, well, the unit was never zero, the product of U and T is also not zero. So this is a well-defined map. And uh, it has an inverse just constructed in the same way, replacing U by U inverse. That's <laughs> as typical with these things. It's completely trivial, but it turns out to be very important. So the point is that, um, right, so we had F minus one defined as a sum end of, um, of f of x times a1 minus zero. And any automorphism of x times a1 minus zero is gonna define an automorphism of this f uh, evaluated at x times a1 minus zero. And well, any automorphism of a sum of two objects, it has a sort of matrix form and one entry will just be an automorphism of this guy. Um, well, I guess endomorphism in general. And so if you just pass to this, uh, to this, to this particular sum end, which is the first contraction, you get some map, which we can denote by, I don't know, multiplication by U or something like that. And um, so it's not immediately obvious, but it is true that this is uh, compatible with um, multiplication of units. So what you find is that this F minus one guy, it automatically has an action by the sort of sheaf of units, right? So this is some sheaf and this is some other sheaf and this one acts on this one. In fact, if you know about these things, there's something called um, the sheaf of Grotendieck Wittrings. So this is somehow related to asymmetric bilinear forms over uh, your smooth varieties. And it turns out that uh, this OX, this action of, um, of the units, it determines a module structure of this guy over the um, Grotendieck Wittring, which is uh, how this is uh, usually presented, but it, it, it's not relevant for what I'm gonna do but just in case that's what you've seen. Okay, so now what we have is we have some action by this uh, sheaf of units and what I can uh, use this for among other things is, is so-called twisting. So that's, that's what's my title of this slide. So I should explain that. So the point is- uh, Sorry, sorry, sorry. Can I interrupt you on a second here? Sure. So Shahar has asked 
if this is like the action of S1 on the free loop space. Uh, maybe let me see if I can unmute. I mean, the free loop space is like this guy. Uh, this is basically the free loop space. So this is the, the F minus one is not the free loop space, but it's surely related to that. Yeah. Is it Shahar? Are you? Okay. Yeah. He muted himself again, so I guess he's satisfied. Um. Ah, okay. So now suppose that I have a line bundle, right? So this is some sheaf, which is locally on X uh, isomorphic to just O. So I could look at the non-vanishing sections of L, then it would be locally isomorphic to this O times, to the, to the units. And uh, so then what I just do is I take my sheaf F and I um, basically take the product with the L minus zero and then I uh, equalize the action or I guess co-equalize, it's some kind of quotient standard, but I think we are notation uh, you, yeah, I mean, you sort of, you do the obvious thing. And uh, then of course, locally, this guy here is the same guy as this guy here. So locally, somehow you haven't changed the sections of F, but in some sense, you've changed the transition functions or the gluing data. So globally, you've built, you've built a big, a different sheaf. And uh, this is, uh, well, I find it very sad and confusing because somehow locally nothing happens, but globally, something happens and in a lot of and a lot of times somehow you're trying to do something locally which seems reasonable but it doesn't work globally and the, the fix is almost always that you you twist it by something and you just you just forgot or didn't notice so this is why this will come up there's a question is there a question hold on yes oh yeah yeah there is sorry uh, go ahead uh, I'm sorry, uh, why there is a minus one there? The, in your H0, there's no minus one or something. Oh, there is a minus one missing there. You're absolutely right. So I cannot uh, fix it right now, but you're correct. There should be a minus one right here. Doesn't make sense otherwise. Sorry. So uh, could I just uh, say if XL equals to H1 of this, so both, both sides have no uh, minus one? No, just... no, no. Both sides, both sides must have a minus one because otherwise you don't have an action of O times, right? So O times acts oh. on F minus one, but not on F. Okay, 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 thanks, thanks. Okay, there is also a question by Harry, I think. Oh, sorry, what is the map from L minus zero to O times? There's none, there's an action of O times on L minus zero by multiplication. Okay, oh, so, okay. The, that I thought that was a pullback. It's a yeah. I mean, that's somehow standard notation. But if you have two things with a G action and you take their product and you make sort of the G action on the left do the same thing on the right by a quotient, then it's denoted like this pullback. I don't know, but okay. Kind of All right. Standard. Okay. Thanks. So I've seen people put the O times on top, which I think makes more sense. But it's even less standard. So I thought for this slide, I would use the standard notation. Okay. So. Now we come to the third operation, which is the transfer, which is uh, very, very important. So this, this works as follows. I start with a finitely generated field extension, which I denote by capital K. Now that seems like a very algebraic non-geometric thing, but the point is that because my base field is uh, assumed to be perfect, there, well, this, this capital K, it will always be the fraction field of some smooth variety. And in particular, if I have a sheaf defined on the smooth varieties, I can also extend it to these fields because it's basically just taking the stock at the generic point of this variety. And of course the variety itself is not uh, uniquely determined by K, but um, the stock is. So this sort of makes sense. So I will, without further comment, evaluate my sheaves also on, on these big fields. And now I'm gonna choose an even bigger field, which I call L and it's gonna be some uh, extension of K, of course, and I want it to be finite and I want it to be simple. So it's generated by one element. And moreover, I want to choose a generator, right? So that's all in the notation. I choose my X, which is in fact in L and it generates L as a field over K. And I want this X to satisfy some uh, equation. So it's not a purely transcendental extension. And then uh, I, I do the following thing. I, I consider the affine line over, over capital K um, if you want to be very precise, this is not, an, uh, not a smooth variety because, uh, well, the capital K one is, is just too big. If you want it, it's, it's going to be a pro object in our categories. But 
for, for lots of purposes, you can just pretend this is an algebraic variety and just run with it. Um, okay, and so my, my, my uh, fear, the, the sort of the spectrum of the, cap, of the big field, it's gonna embed as a point into the affine, affine, <coughs> affine line over capital K. But, I mean, basically because that's, that's what the points are, right? So if you have a, have a field, you look at the affine line, the close points correspond precisely sort of to um, maximal ideas in the polynomial ring. And then you look at the uh, minimal polynomial isopods of X. And the affine line, I can then embed into the projective line I mean, for whatever reason, but certainly I'm a, I, I can do it. And now I do the following thing. I take the projective line and I over K and I, or capital K, and I collapse the complement of this point spec L corresponding to X. Okay, so then I get some sort of collapse map here, which I denote T, and then there's where the magic happens. There's uh, something called the homotopy purity theorem, which tells you that there is, uh, uh, there is in fact a canonical equivalence between this guy and uh, the projective line over L. Now, if you're, you're an expert and you're already uh, itching to correct me, and I will point out that I'm being somewhat liberal with the truth here, and uh, I don't want to say more, but because it, it, Right, so there's some irrelevant technicality which makes the statement false, but you can easily fix it if you know what the problem is. And uh, so now this, this collapse map, of course, I mean, even in classical topology, right? So there's so-called pontryagin tomb collapse maps and lots of collapse maps and they often turn out to be very important. So the same thing happens here. So why do I care about the projective line? Because uh, it turns out that it's actually equivalent to the smash product of S1 and GM. And so what this means is that I take my collapse map, which I identified, I mean, together with this equivalence here, I can view this as a map from P1 over K to P1 over L. And now I pull back along this map in the first einberg maclean uh, space of F, right? So then I'm pulling this S1, it's gonna cancel the one here, and then I'm having this GM here, so I'm gonna see GM loops of F, which we saw as F minus one. So in the end, what I get is a map from F minus one of capital L to F minus one of capital K. So of course there was a map the other, the, the other way around already because it's a field extension and well, it's a sheaf. So it has these pullback maps, but it turns out that there's this wrong way map, which is called a transfer. So I put a little X up here to remind us that it depended on the choice of generator. So I like to call this the monogeneic transfer. Um, Morel, I think is the one who defined it. He calls it a geometric transfer. And uh, yeah, so it, it, it depends on all of this data and this will be, this will be very important. Um, you can make it somehow depend on less data by twisting, but let's, let's not overdo it. But then you get something called maybe the cohomological transfer or the absolute transfer, if you've heard these words and they're related to this kind of construction, they will just, um, yeah, so, so they make it somehow more canonical. Okay, so then finally the fourth operation, which I want to tell you about, the so-called boundary. And uh, this, this works also as follows as, well, with every one of the operations I'm talking about, what you do is you choose some smooth variety X and I will choose some global section. And then I can look at the vanishing locus of that global section and I call it Y. And uh, this may or may not be a smooth variety, but let's, let's suppose that it is, all right? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at, um, I don't, I, this is more sketchy even than the other ones, but because we need it less, but so the point is you look at the long exact sequence for cohomology with support in Z. And uh, this has a boundary map, okay? <laughs> so it's gonna start with um, F uh, evaluated on the complement and then it goes to the um, cohomology of Z, uh, uh, the cohomology of X supported in Y. And then you can use the somatopy purity magic again to identify this with F minus one of Y. And so the point is that this, somehow this abstract cohomology technology gives you this boundary map here and depending on the choice of generator. And uh, again, one can make it more invariant by twisting. So let me quickly sketch that. So in general, what you do is you, you choose your uh, closed co-dimension one smooth sub variety Y, and then there's gonna be a boundary map. Uh, and if you don't wanna make it depend on the generator, what you have to do is you have to twist the F minus one sheaf by some line bundle by some cleverly chosen line bundle. And that line bundle is called the um, co-normal sheaf. Um, I hope, well, it's this guy here. <laughs> um, 
the determinant of the uh, co-normal bundle or also the determinant of the cotangent complex. So, for example, if you have this global generator T, then it will define a trivializing global section of this omega y over x. So once you choose the T, you get an isomorphism between this guy and this guy, and then this map turns into this map. But it turns out that if you write it like this, it doesn't depend on, on the choices. Okay, but uh, this was mainly uh, <laughs> my chance to introduce the, well, to remind you of the twisting and to introduce the um, conormal bundle, conormal, yeah. The omega y of x. Okay, finally, finally we have all the operations. So I will try to tell you how to compute the cohomology of a strictly homotopy invariant sheaf. And uh, well, there's a there's a theorem with many names attached to it, which tells you that you can do this. So there's a paper written by the first uh, three authors, and uh, they call it it's uh, the on the Bloch August Gaba theorem. So what do I know? Who did what? But for us, the result is the following. If you take your strictly homotopy invariant sheaf, then there exists a special complex, which is in fact a flask resolution, um, which looks as follows. Well, you have your sheaf and you view it as a sheaf only on the small and the side of X. Then we resolve it by some complex of sheaves, C0, C1, and so on and so forth. And there's an explicit formula for the nth term, which works as follows. You look at all the points of a co-dimension N on X. So Remember that if you take a scheme, then there are sort of the closed points, which are the usual reasonable points, and then there are, well, not closed points, so they're the ones where you take the closure and you get, well, some closed subscheme. And then this closed subscheme has some sort of codimension, and that's what I mean by a point of codimension n, right? So it's one where its closure has codimension n. And you sum all of them together, you take the nth construct contraction, and you evaluate it at that point, right? So the, uh, the residue field, if you want, of that point is one of your finitely generated extensions of K. So you're allowed to evaluate and you're twisting by the uh, determinant of the cotangent complex of this inclusion. Um, that's, that's what it is. And uh, so in order, so, so the claim is that this complex exists and it's exact sort of on, uh, on, on local rings. And uh, so this means that you can use it to compute the cohomology, it turns out. But of course you have to ask, well, so I've basically exactly given you what the terms are and the, the, the question is, what is the boundary map? If you ever want to really compute the cohomology, you need to also understand the boundary map. And uh, that's, that's complicated, but um, well, there are ways of writing it in terms of um, the long uh, sort of cohomology with support, long exact sequences of cohomology of support. But uh, in the case of a strictly homotopy invariant sheaf, there are some, some simplification happens and this is, uh, I believe due to Morel, certainly it's explained in his book. Uh, yeah, that was definitely due to Morel. And the point is that if you want to know what this boundary map is, there's an ex explicit formula for it and it involves lots of things, but importantly, it involves the boundary which we talked about earlier, sort of the co-dimension one smooth boundary, and it involves the transfer. So let me, uh, right. And so maybe this boundary map here is called the Ross-Schmidt boundary because, um, so there's this uh, important work by Markus Rost on uh, cycle modules. And he says, if you start with something called a cycle module, whatever that is, then you can write down a certain complex, which you can use to compute some cohomology. And uh, basically he writes down the formula for the boundary and it's exactly the same one, which I'm gonna write down, just the, the, the one which uh, Fabienne wrote down is just more complicated because of the twisting. So for, for, for Rost, there are no twists. So he deals with special sheaves where the twisting never does anything. Okay, so then uh, let me try to explain how the boundary map works, at least roughly. And uh, so this goes as follows, right? So suppose you want to know the boundary from Cn to Cn plus one. Then the Cn is gonna be a sum over points of co-dimension n like x of uh, these nth contractions. And the same thing happens here. And now what you do is you look at the closure of your point of co-dimension n. This is, well, some subscheme. And what you do is you choose a point of co-dimension one on that subscheme. So in other words, a point of co-dimension n plus one in Z. So basically you choose a direct specialization from X to Y. And then there will be a contribution of the boundary map from X to Y. And these will be all the contributions, right? So this is some huge sum here, some huge sum here. So the boundary map is some huge matrix and they will always sort of all entries correspond to direct specializations. 
And uh, so what do you do? Okay, let me quickly go over this. But, um, so what you do is you take your Z, which is some uh, scheme, likely singular, some dimension. But what you do is you localize it in this point of co-dimension one. So now you have a curve in some sense. It's not sort of finite type over the base field K, which we started with, but it's some kind of curve. And then what you do is you normalize it. So you pass to the Z tilde guy, uh, some canonical procedure. If you know about algebraic geometry, this is some finite birational morphism. So the Z tilde is now a smooth curve in some sense. And then how does the boundary map work? Well, you start at F minus one, uh, F minus N of X, right? So because this map P was birational, it means that the generic point of this uh, Z tilde is the same thing as the generic point of uh, Z, which is X. So that's actually the same group here as the sort of uh, generic point of the, um, of the smooth curve. And then we had, a, we had a boundary map, right, for smooth curves, which then goes into the special fiber. And now you're somehow in some field extension, so you have to transfer it down again. So what you see is that it involves, I mean, this Rothschmidt boundary, it involves all the primitive other operations. And also, I have omitted twists here because otherwise it would be even more illegible, but you have to put appropriate twists there and you have to check that various things like canonically, right? you have to check some things about these uh, determinants of cotangent complexes and so on. But the point is, there is some sort of complicated but manageable formula, which in principle allows you to compute this cohomology. I mean, this boundary map and then the cohomology in terms of the geometry, of course, of um, your, your, your variety and of the sheet. So all of this is uh, just to prepare you for the following sort of, <laughs> I will call it curious observations. Right, so we had this complex here, which we can use to compute cohomology. And uh, this, not very surprising, the complex depends functorially on F. That seems reasonable enough. But uh, look at the actual formula, the nth term, right, it doesn't sort of just depend on f. There's no f here, right? There's an f, well, here's an f, but <laughs> there's an f minus n. And actually, you see the nth term, it only depends on f minus n, right? It doesn't depend on all of f. Um, and similarly, the boundary, right, I just explained it to you what it does. You start with f minus n, you do some pullback, you do some boundary, which only depends on f minus n, you do some transfer, which uh, only depends on f minus n, and so on and so forth, right? So it has the follow the, the, this, this Rothschmidt complex, it has the curious property that the nth term only depends on the f minus n and the nth boundary also depends only on f minus n. So if you somehow, if you chop off the first couple of terms, then you get something which only depends on f minus n. Okay, who cares? So here's a, a consequence again, who cares, but you go, right. So we can do the following thing. So suppose I choose some closed subvariety z of co-dimension, let's say at least D. So I want to compute now the cohomology uh, with support in Z. And there's a, there's a very easy way of doing this. You just uh, modify this first mid complex a little bit where, well, you know what you have to do. You have to take the map to the, um, the restriction map to the open complement. You want this to be a surjection, great it is. And then you take the kernel. So what this means is just instead of taking all the points of co-dimension N, you only take the points of co-dimension N which happen to lie in Z. Couldn't be easier. Okay, so then this gives me a new complex. I mean, you get a subcomplex of the Rosmit complex, and it turns out that this guy computes the uh, cohomology with support in Z. But look, if I take some point uh, X, which has co-dimension less than D, then of course it cannot lie in Z. So this means that the first couple of groups in this complex, they're all zero. And then the first one, which you see is somehow F minus D of the generic points of Z, and then you get F minus D minus one and so on and so forth. So what you find is that this entire complex only depends on f minus d and not on all of f. And the conclusion is that in particular, this cohomology with support in z only depends on f minus d. Again, I will, I will admit this is maybe a bit esoteric, but while we're at it, I feel like uh, there's a question which uh, presents itself, which is if I have some map from y to x, then I can of do, of course, do pullback in the uh, cohomology with support in Z. And I land in cohomology with support in the inverse image of Z. Now this group only depends on uh, F minus D. This maybe also only depends on F minus D, but what about the map? I mean, 
I don't know what this map map is. I mean, it comes out of some weird injective resolution sheaf cohomology theory. What do I know? But surely one would guess that it should also only depend on f minus d. Now, if we've already looked at this crazy, crazy observation, that I feel is a, is a reasonable question. And uh, <laughs> okay, uh, okay, I'll say this to you. So here is now the main theorem which I want to tell you about, which basically says this is true. Okay, so the, the, the theorem states that, well, the first obvious thing which you want to require is that uh, this inverse image of Z also has co-dimension at least D, because otherwise we don't even know that this group only depends on F minus D. And then I will look at the pullback, not on the entire cohomology, but I will only look uh, sort of at the lowest non-zero cohomology. And the claim is that then it only depends on F minus D, together with its um, twisting action, which is obvious, right? So the definition of the Ross-Schmidt complex, you already need the twisting action. Um, actually, the complex itself does not depend on the transfer map, but I will prove, or I will sketch proof that um, this pullback map here, it only depends on F minus D on the, um, on the action by units and on the transfers. And uh, again, I feel like if I would have started with this, with this statement, you would have all zoned out because who cares? But so the point is that these, this motivic homology whitehead theorem, which I uh, explained in the teaser trailer slide, uh, it uses, or I mean, yeah, so, so it, it follows from this and some, a lot of extra work. Uh, in, so I, I hope <laughs> in a non-obvious way, but maybe also in an obvious way, but so that's, that's why this technical result I feel is very important. Okay. Um. Let me stop you one, for one second to ask if there are any questions from the audience. If you have questions, raise your hand or write them, please. Doesn't seem to be any questions. Okay. okay. So now I will uh, explain some things about the proof. Probably I won't manage everything and uh, I, I think that will be fine, but let's, let's give some ideas how this works. Um, the first case, uh, and the easiest case by far, is when this map F happens to be itself smooth. Then what do we do? Well, the point is basically that in this case, there's an obvious map on the Ross-Schmidt complex, uh, which, which just works. So let's skip the details. But the point is that you get a map from the Ross-Schmidt resolution of uh, F over X to the Ross-Schmidt resolution of F over Y, and it's, it's given by some obvious formula on, on every component, the formula being given here. And it has to do with the fact that a smooth or more generally a flat map, it, uh, it preserves co-dimension. So there's no problem in writing down uh, what, this, what this map should do. And so the point is that by the formula which you write down, you find that this map only depends on F minus N. And so then you have, uh, right. So the point is, that you've, you've, in general, right, if you have some sheaf, you want to compute its cohomology, you use a, you use a resolution. And then you want to uh, have some other sheaf and compute also its homology use, uh, cohomology use some other resolution. And how do you compute the map, the induced map? Uh, well, you have to Sorry, uh, yes. sorry Tom, there, uh, an, a question appeared, actually. The uh, okay. question is whether you're going to do any computations in this talk. No. Okay. Of course not. <laughs> I'm going to leave the person that's asked the question anonymous. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. No, I, I'm not a computations person. I, yeah. Okay, so the point is, right, so you choose any map between the resolutions. This gives you the correct map on cohomology. And then uh, you can restrict it somehow to the resolutions of the cohomology with support. And this gives you the correct map on cohomology with support. And this is just how it goes. That's, that's what uh, chief cohomology theory tells you you should do. So we write down this obvious map, you get everything. And so the problem, the problem is that if you take um, any map which is, uh, which is not smooth or more generally flat, so which does not preserve co-dimension, there's not an obvious map to write down, right? Basically because you have some closed subset of some co-dimension then, and you have something, some sort of data on it and you're supposed to then somehow pull it back to Y, but you might now be supported on the subset of different co-dimension. You just don't know where to go. So that's, that's what the difficulty is. But okay, I mean, this move case is completely valid. And uh, 
So if you have a map between smooth schemes, it can always, uh, at least locally, be factored into composite of smooth maps and of somehow uh, crew dimension one closed immersions. And uh, so from this, it follows basically that the difficult case which you have to treat is the co-dimension one closed immersion. And um, well, I mean, that, that was obvious from the start, but uh, just, to, just to point that out. So really what I'm now gonna do is I'm gonna try to understand how the pullback map on a co-dimension one closed immersion works. Okay. So basically what I'm gonna do, well, so for, for a long time I, I, was, I was stuck and I didn't know what to do. But then, uh, as uh, somehow works often in my research, I was reading a paper of Mark Levine, and I found that uh, he has a very useful result, which I can steal and adapt and try to make work. And uh, so this, here's what I call a transfer trick lemma. So this is basically an adaptation of some lemma of uh, Mark Levine. Um, so you can see it has lots of assumptions. So I'm sorry, it's, it's getting a bit technical now, but all right, so here, here's what we do. So suppose I have my closed immersion of uh, y into x of co-dimension one, let me denote this map by i. And then what I uh, also have is I have, um, right, so basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the pullback, not, uh, from, not, not the pullback along i, but along sort of p1 times i. So I will assume that I have uh, some closed subset z in uh, p1 over x. And then I, I immediately sort of build myself additional um, additional data, right? So I, I can intersect the Z with P1 over Y, I get the W, and I can uh, look at the images of um, Z and W, I get Z prime and W prime. And then I make some assumptions. Basically, I want the co-dimension of Z and P1 to be, well, at least D, that's, that's always happening. And I want the co-dimension of W and P1 to be at least D, that's sort of our running assumption. And I also want, to, I will assume that Z to Z prime is finite which um, in particular means that Z and Z prime have the same dimension, which means that Z prime has co-dimension at, at least D minus one. And also W prime then has the same dimension as W, so it will also have co-dimension at least D minus one. And here's, here's the crucial point. I'm going to assume that this map uh, on the Ws is birational. And then, okay, so as I said, we, we are supposed to study the pullback along some closed immersion. The closed immersion which I choose is uh, um, y times p1 into x times p1. So there's this pullback map here. And the claim is of course that it only depends on f minus d. And well, the lemma says, I, I'm not quite strong enough to prove this, but I know that it only depends on f minus d and it uh, depends on the um, pullback map uh, on the cohomology of x and y, but sort of evaluated on f minus one and the cohomology, not the dth cohomology, but the d minus first cohomology. So there's this red minus one here, which is very important. And I think you can see where this is going, which is that we're gonna be um, doing an induction argument, right? So um, I want to prove that for every d, the pullback only depends on f minus d. So I suppose I have proved it for, um, for f d minus one, then I know that th this one only depends on, well, f minus one minus d minus one, so I'm f minus d and on the transfers. So then basically I learned that uh, this pullback here does what I think it does. But of course, the problem is <laughs> that not every map between every co-dimension one closed immersion is of the form x time, uh, y times p1 into x times p1, right? So there's, there's still more to come. But, um, okay, so I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna skip how this works. But the idea is that you use the transfer. Tom, you're not running out of time at all. You what? have still 20 minutes if you want them. But I mean, I thought there were supposed to be questions. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Questions during the talk, which you're answering. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. So then let me, let me sketch how this transfer lemma is proved because I think, I mean, this is basically the most important insight. And uh, well, as I said, it's uh, Mark Levine's, but so here is my interpretation. So on the top, I have uh, sort of tried to draw all the data which we were uh, considering, right? So we have my Y into X which is the closed immersion. Then I have P1Y over P1X, also the closed immersion. And then I had some data, some sort of support data associated with this whole thing, right? So I have W inside P1 over Y. I have uh, Z inside P1 over X. And then I have their images W prime and Z prime. And this map here was supposed to be birational. 
and this map here was supposed to be finite, and so this one's also finite. And the claim is that, uh, well, I can of course pull back in cohomology here, I can pull back in cohomology here, but the claim is that there is also some transfer operation which goes in this direction. So there will be a commutative diagram like this. And I mean, you have to, you have to construct this transfer, but it's, uh, it's reasonably straightforward. Um, basically, because you, if you remember how the transfer works, it, it comes from, it's sort of built into the, into the nature of P1. And so here I have put a P1, which is why there is, there's just a transfer. So this is a very stupid operation in some ways. But it really does boil down to the transfer map, which I described earlier. And uh, so what do I do? Well, I was supposed to figure out what this map from here to here does, right? And now my claim is that this, this map here, this transfer is actually an injection. So I want to know what this does. So supposing that I know what this does, and I told you it's a stupid map, so we know what it does. It's enough to figure out what this composite does here, right? From here to here. But now the nature of the commutative diagram tells me it's enough to figure out what this map does. So we know what this does. So it's enough to figure out what this map does. And uh, well, that's, that's the proof of the theorem. <laughs> of course, you have to fill in some details, right? You have to prove that this commutes. You have to figure out what the transfer should be and that it only depends on F minus D. And also you have to ask, why is this map an injection, right? So this is maybe the main surprising point. But of course, it comes from this assumption that W to W prime is birational, right? So uh, if you want to think about this, this is sort of the lowest cohomology group. So it will inject actually into the corresponding uh, Ross Schmidt term, right? But this is now a sum basically over the rational points, uh, the generic points of Z. And in our case, the generic points of W of something. And here's the generic points of W prime. But what does it mean to be birational? It means that the generic points are the same. So you inject both of these somehow into the same group and then this map has to be an injection. That's, that's, that's the idea. Okay, so that's, that's what Mark Levine figured, or I, I don't know. This is strongly inspired by a paper of Mark Levine. So now, now I can try to explain how the proof is supposed to go. And well, it's, it's only gonna get more technical, sorry. But okay, so to remind you, we have a closed immersion of Y into X of co-dimension one and Y is smooth. And I have some support Z, which is uh, closed and of co-dimension at least D. But I mean, of course it might be singular. And in fact, the, the only real difficulty is when Z is singular. So very soon there's gonna be a picture, but uh, okay, so for now words. And then I have the W, which is the intersection of C and Y. And um, we're always gonna assume that it also has co-dimension at least D. And what we're, our task is to understand this pullback map here. And of course, what we're supposed to prove is that it only depends on F minus D and on the transfers and on the twists. Okay, so this is too difficult. We need to make it easier. Um, so I'm, this, is, this is only gonna be a sketch proof. I'm sorry, because we don't have five hours, but well, I don't know, I don't. But so here's, here's my attempt at the sketch. So the first thing uh, which you do is you choose some point W, uh, which is a generic point of co-dimension D. And it turns out that everything is sort of local around this point. Um, so what you can do is you can just localize everything. That would make it uh, much easier, right? So once you do this, the W just, uh, the capital W just has one point, namely this W which we're interested in, and it's a closed point, right? So that's what localization does. It turns whatever point you had into a closed point. And uh, in fact, it's not just sort of local in the, um, local in the Zariski topology, it's local in the Nisnevich topology. And what this means is that I cannot just localize everything, I can hensilize it, what, whatever that means. And so one, one good fact, so let's say maybe we're in characteristic zero, is that if you take a Hensel local ring over um, essentially smooth over some perfect field, then actually sort of the inclusion of the, res of the closed point, it always splits. So what this means is that I can somehow make everything work. I can change my base field to be the residue field of W in a non-trivial way. And then it's not just a, a closed point, it's even a rational point. Okay, so we had this complicated thing where the W was maybe some generic point of some terrible sub-variety, but now actually it's a closed point. Um, yeah, it's a closed rational point. At the cost that now my varieties are maybe um, only sort of pro objects or essentially smooth or something like that, but okay, let's, 
Let's not overdo it. Okay, and because I've also localized, right, so the W is a closed point of co-dimension D on Y, so then Y must have dimension D, and uh, well, it was a co-dimension one immersion, so then X has dimension D plus one. And also the Y is supposed to be some smooth subscheme of co-dimension one, so it means that locally it's cut out by one equation, but I've also localized, right, so it will be cut out by one equation. So I can choose that one equation, I call it F. And uh, everything is affine and small and sort of nice. So we've, we've made the problem a little bit easier. And now here comes, here comes the punch. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use some kind of Gaber, Gaber's lemma style result. So if you've heard about Gaber's lemma, um, I can never remember what it says. I know it's some very difficult result to prove in particular if the field is uh, finite, but it does some esoteric things and it constructs certain functions for you. Yeah. And uh, it turns out that here, here that there's some variant of this Gaber lemma, and you can also use lots of algebraic, well, more algebraic geometry than I usually use, but you can prove the following. So you find yourself some functions, I call them u, phi 2, phi 3, and so on, on up to phi d plus 1, and they are regular functions on x. And I will uh, immediately introduce a function called phi 1, which is just the product of u and f, right? So remember, f was the thing cutting out y, and u is well, whatever, it will have some properties. And then I get a map from X to A to the D plus one. And the, the, the magic of the Gaber lemma is that you can ensure um, a whole bunch of things. So uh, in particular, this is gonna be some map which sends my distinguished point W to zero. I mean, that's, that's not a huge deal. And it will also be the case that the U doesn't vanish at W and um, Right, so lots of properties are gonna hold. So if you look at, um, if, you, if you do know Gaber's lemma, then the sort of the most important part is uh, this, this last one, which is that you have this closed immersion into A1 over something. This is basically the main thing which Gaber's lemma buys you. Um, so I'm not, I, I don't wanna uh, say exactly what all the properties are, that um, so, so one thing maybe to say is that uh, I said Gaber's lemma is very difficult to prove for finite fields, but the proof is gonna work. I mean, I, for now I only explain characteristic zero, right? But the proof is gonna work in such a way that we're reducing to an infinite field at an earlier stage. So this is a fair, whatever the things are that I'm claiming here, they're sort of fairly standard uh, general position arguments which allow you to prove this. Okay, so now we're gonna forget all of this. Well, not really. So hopefully now you can, yes, you can see the, my artistic impression of what is going on. So let me try to explain that instead of having all that many symbols. So let's look at this picture, right? So on the left side, basically the entire, so, so I'm dealing with the case D equals two because my paper is only two dimensional. On the left side, you have this variety X. Everything, the entire paper is the variety, variety X. And then we have our smooth co-dimension sub one sub variety Y, and it's gonna be in blue. So I've uh, drawn some sort of squiggly line here because, uh, well, it's co-dimension one, so it's some kind of curve. It's doesn't have any kinks or self intersections or that sort of thing. It's a smooth curve. Okay, and then we also have the Z, right? So the Z was some co-dimension one subscheme, and it turns out the most, uh, I mean, the problematic situation arises when the Z has a singularity on the intersection with Y. So I've drawn a little curve here with the self intersection exactly where it hits Y, right? So that's really unfortunate because that's what makes it difficult. But let's say we have that. And now there's my map phi, which goes down to A2 in this case. And uh, what's gonna happen? Well, so there's the first coordinate phi one, right? And if you think about the phi one, it was the product of U and F, where F was the thing which cuts out Y. So it tells you that inside A2, I have somehow the zero locus of the first coordinate is an A1, and the pre-image consists of Y, this is the blue guy, and it also consists of some other stuff, right? So I have Z of phi one, I've denoted in green. It uh, consists of all of Y. And then there's some other thing which might be singular, which might may meet Z and so on and so forth. But it's not gonna meet this particular point here. That's one of the uh, things which we had ensured in the construction. And uh, okay, and it takes the map phi, it takes Z to whatever, it takes it to some sort of other support here. It's gonna have the property that it's finite sort of in the way down here and it's gonna be a closed immersion somewhere. 
but um, without going into too much uh, detail, the point, the point of this whole thing, which is also, I mean, what I learned from Mark Levine's paper, is that you can use this somehow GABA map phi to straighten out your Y, right? So this was some smooth sub-variety. You can turn it into an affine line or some affine space, right? So of course, you know that smooth varieties are supposed to be a bit like affine spaces, but this is usually sort of local. But the GABA thing tells you that you can really globally turn it into an actual A1 or a, a N or something like that. I mean, at, at some cost, of course, right? So this map here is gonna be an at all neighborhood of this point. So that's, that's why you have a chance of doing things. And um, what it does is it's, it somehow it has increased, right? I don't just have Y, I also have um, some extra bits here, some junk, which I had to add at the co in order to make it global, but okay. So that's, that's what you can do. And um, so from there, uh, we can sort of fight our way through, right? So we're supposed to understand this pullback map here from, uh, from X to Y. Now, as I said, this problem is somehow local on W, so I can look at some sort of well-chosen neighborhood V with some properties which I'm not gonna explain. So I can go like this. And uh, okay, so this arrow here should have been an equivalence. I forgot, right? So all the arrows here are actually equivalence. So you wanna go from here to here to, and you want to understand what this does, but it's actually isomorphic to this. So I could understand it here. And then again, the, because it's sort of a Nisnevich local around W, I can in fact understand it uh, under phi by a sort of um, Nisnevich excision. And what, what this does is it has transformed me from understanding this inclusion of Y into X into this inclusion here of U into A1 over U, right? So I, well, I don't know somehow the, the, the proof works, but what I think of it is that we have straightened out uh, the relationship between y and x to turn it into an actual a1. And so what this, what this tells me is that I can replace x and y by u and a1 over u, right? So that the whole, the whole proof basically goes by making more and more simplifications to the situation until we get something which we can understand. And then we use this other part of GABA lemma, which says that um, the z u to u was finite, which means that if I replace say a1 over u by p1 over u, the Z remains closed in there, right? So it's, um, it says projective over U, so it will remain closed in anything over U. So I can in particular replace it by P1 over U. Okay, so now I need to understand somehow the pullback from P1 over U, um, from U to P1 over U. And um, it turns out that this is exactly the sort of thing which we can understand using this um, transfer trick. And then we can get an induction started and uh, right, if you keep fighting, you may prove the theorem. And that's, that's the end. Okay, uh, that's great. I'm going to unmute everyone so we can clap. Okay, I'm going to mute uh, uh, everyone again. Uh, Oh, I might um, have to unmute the speaker. So are there any questions? I made it so you can unmute yourself, but uh, raise your hand before asking the question. So, okay, we have Nanjun. Uh, 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 sorry, so I have a question. Uh, uh, so you uh, show, show that you could uh, do the pullback for code dimension one, and I, uh, I, I I'm interested in that uh, if for general co-dimension, uh, how do you suppose that, that is how do you, how do you do induction by uh, successfully uh, on the, uh, do uh, do pullbacks on divisors? Since uh, if you have a if you have a, a, a proper intersection, then how how do you find a success successive uh, smooth divisors such that uh, each step is a, a proper intersection? This is what I was thinking. Uh, so you're asking for general co-dimensions. You're asking about this claim here that I only need to, to treat the co-dimension one case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how, how about the, the general co-dimension case? How do you find the uh, su successive uh, inclusions of divisors such as uh, the pullback, pullback of each, each state is uh, proper in, in section? This is uh, something. Right. Um, 
this, 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 I consider this uh, uh, problem uh, before, but I, I don't. Yeah. If I get this, and this. Well, so I should definitely uh, check the proof in the paper, but I think the idea is that, um, I mean, I'm starting with uh, y into x, let's say, of some positive co-dimension, and the assumption is, uh, maybe I should, so we have prepared this, yeah, so I stop this sharing here, and then I do, I should, no. I'm trying to share. Okay, so now I have a whiteboard, maybe. Can you see something? Yeah. Okay, so I start with, no, I need a pen. Start with y into x, right? So of co-dimension d, or I don't know, co-dimension n. And the assumption is you have some z here, such that if I intersect it here, right? And I assume that this is co-dimension d, and the assumption is that this guy also has co-dimension d, right? Yeah, so yeah, this yeah, is probably, built in yeah. from the start. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. And then what I think I do, just I factor this y into x into steps of co-dimension one. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what's going to happen is that each time you intersect the z with the next one, the dimension of z drops by at most one. But if yeah, I do yeah. it d times, it had to drop. Uh, if I do it n times, it had to drop by n. And so the conclusion is that at, at, at each step, it had to drop exactly by one. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, but but maybe uh, some intersections uh, they are uh, they are not irreducible. They're, they have no. That, they have, that's uh, right. Components. The, the, the z could be terrible. I agree. Yeah. So so maybe uh, so uh, even uh, so so maybe after in the intersection the coordination is correct. But maybe uh, each step there are, there are some bigger coordination things that. Uh, when, when you intersect with a smaller uh, divisor, it, it, uh, the, 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 two, the, uh, the intersection is void. So, so, so some, some bigger co-dimension was uh, omitted uh, after in intersection. But, uh, I, I, just, I think, uh, 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 I so, think so you're this, right. This, this could conceivably happen. But somehow the problem is only local around... Hmm. Okay, I should okay, think okay, about okay, that. I should okay, think okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Mm. Okay, thanks. Okay. Are there other questions? No one has any other questions, so I'm going to unmute everyone again and let's thank the speaker again. Okay, uh, I'm going to mute Christian. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, okay, thank you very much for your talk, Tom. And uh, now we are having, if my program is... Did you stop reliable. recording? Hey, did you oh, stop yeah, recording? Oh yeah, we should stop recording. That's true, that's true, that's true.